I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending this uh, conference this year, and um, I'm happy you've all stuck around to watch my presentation. So my name is Zachariah Peterson, and I'll be talking about random laser dynamics in disordered and semi-ordered cavities. So my, uh, my research primarily relates to uh, instabilities in uh, zinc oxide random lasers. So if you know anything about random lasers, you're probably aware it's essentially a totally random system that exhibits very high Q resonances uh, and laser emission with very high Q line uh, peaks. And uh, this is a bit counterintuitive. You wouldn't expect a random system to uh, exhibit this type of emission. Um, one of the primary uh, challenges has been to uh, get to reproducibility and uh, specifically with reproducibility with longer pump pulse times and so zinc oxide random lasers, other random lasers uh, typically uh, optically pumped. Um, what I'll do is I'll present a uh, time dependent theory which I developed in an earlier paper and I'll present some results showing the dynamic behavior and some stability results. So zinc oxide, uh, I'll just give a quick uh, uh, background overview. Um, uh, it's a, a, a wide band gap semiconductor, 3.37 electron volt band gap. Um, the, uh, the emission is primarily exciton, exciton scattering at room temperature until you get to high pump fluence, uh, and then it switches over to electron hole plasma. Um, carrier recombination is somewhat short, you know, 200 picoseconds. And one thing that you principally uh, observe is, is uh, emission fluctuations when pump pulses are actually quite long. Uh, however, the, the uh, emission becomes reproducible when the uh, uh, pump pulses get uh, rather short, uh, so less than one nanosecond. Um, we've worked at 800 picoseconds. Others have worked down to you know, 50, 20, 10 picoseconds and less. And there are even results showing femtosecond uh, pumping uh, resulting in uh, random lasing from zinc oxide. And so just to show you an example of, of some of these instabilities and what they look like, uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, th this uh, set of graphs shows results from, uh, from my group uh, with uh, 5 nanosecond pumping at 355 nanometers with an ND YAG laser. Uh, this is from a, uh, a sample with polydisperse, uh, you know, on average 240 nanometer zinc oxide nanoparticles. And then we add in um, some magnesium oxide. Uh, nanoparticles, very small nanoparticles uh, with uh, some defined uh, uh, weight concentration, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so when you do uh, average measurements, um, you can see, you'll, you'll get something that looks like the graph on the left uh, above and below threshold. So above threshold, you, you see what looks like a very wide band, low Q lasing peak. Below threshold, you see the typical photoluminescence spectrum, and I've magnified it on this scale. In the central graph, um, here we're collecting uh, emission from individual pulses uh, integrated over an entire second. Uh, so essentially, this is all possible lasing events that happen during a single pump pulse. Uh, and then uh, on the right, uh, you can see some of these uh, fluctuations in line width as well as the, uh, the average values. And uh, you can see very clearly in the black curve a threshold behavior in the intensity. Um, there's a corresponding threshold in the line width and eventually you get down to very narrow line width, so about three nanometers. And this is much wider than what you typically see with zinc oxide random lasers. Um, however, that is due to a, a few supposed mechanisms. Um, what it's thought to be going on here is that you have maybe, you know, hundreds or thousands of modes lasing all at once in these samples, and then they overlap each other in a time integrated measurement, and then you'd measure this very broad peak. So uh, looking at possible sources of instability, there are a few different uh, supposed uh, uh, mechanisms that drive this. Uh, one of these is uh, the uh, potential for fluctuations in the average power near threshold. And I, I mentioned average very specifically for, for a specific reason. And I'll we'll get into why later. Um, the other possibility is that the microstructure does actually change slightly. So if the microstructure changes, then the mode structure uh, the uh, uh, the wavelengths for the allowed modes, I should say, would also change over time, and then you might expect some kind of random behavior. So this is basically what you see in the in the solutions of laser dyes that are infiltrated with uh, nanoparticles. Um, and then there's a third mechanism that is supposed and uh, has been detailed uh, somewhat in the literature, but it's 
still kind of hypothetical. We don't really know what that is. And this is where a time dependent theory can play a role. So um, if you look at average pump power fluctuations, uh, you would expect the, uh, the fluctuations to be greatest uh, very close to the threshold because that's where the, uh, the uh, input versus or the output uh, intensity versus input curve uh, would be very strongly nonlinear. And the problem is you see these instabilities very hot, far above and very far below the threshold. And so the graph on the right shows, uh, spec shows results from spectra uh, gathered with individual pump laser shots. Um, so this is the same uh, sample uh, that uh, I, I showed earlier. And so you see these, uh, these fluctuations happen uh, far above and far below threshold. Um, so you, you have many modes, they all have somewhat different uh, uh, thresholds and they're all lazing somewhat randomly. So um, in our mind, this essentially eliminates uh, possibility number one, where you have average pump power fluctuations. And indeed, with this laser uh, that we used as the pump, the NDAG laser, uh, when measuring the average power, you get very low th uh, fluctuations. Um, at, uh, across a range of powers. It's all less than 5% fluctuation. So you wouldn't expect that to translate into 70% fluctuations in the emission and the line width uh, all, across, uh, all, all across different pump powers. So we've got two decades worth of pump powers that are shown here. And so that likely eliminates the uh, average pump power uh, fluctuation being responsible for instabilities. The next, uh, looking at accumulated damage, um, there is damage that accumulates when you are pumping at very high fluence um, and when you're pumping with a range of uh, different uh, uh, pulse widths. Uh, however, uh, this damage accumulates over many thousands of pulses. So in the, the two uh, SEM images that I'm comparing here, damage accumulates over, over about 7,500 uh, pump pulses. Um, and you do have strong probability of lazing uh, no matter what. I mean, it happens on the first pulse, it happens on the 7,500th pulse. Um, and that probability of lazing doesn't change. Um, it only changes with the pump fluence, but not necessarily on the shot number. Uh, so for us, this eliminates uh, number two as being uh, responsible for, uh, for the changes uh, in the emission spectra that are observed. Um, and in particular, you can kind of see the, uh, the shape here of this uh, this system largely, you know, pretty similar, um, not huge changes. So I, I don't suspect that uh, these changes are, are going to be responsible for uh, for major changes in the emission spectrum that are observed. Now, one thing that uh, some some folks have done, and this gets to the core of, of the presentation, is uh, to use very high quality structures embedded in the uh, system of random particles to provide some control over the emission. And um, here what you're seeing in the top left graph is you're seeing a set of five emission spectra and you can see very clearly some laser peaks that stand out above the photoluminescence background. Um, so we have here two very clear peaks uh, uh, about 385 and 387 nanometers and then um, a third peak about 380 nanometers and we've even been able to see one single peak. And uh, when we combine zinc oxide, magnesium oxide, and these very high quality 860 nanometer polystyrene spheres at low density, we're able to actually exert some level of control over the emission uh, in this random structure. And so this is where you have like a semi-ordered structure. So there's some other methods for emission control. You can anneal to get lower threshold, to get to lower threshold as you're essentially annealing away structural defects. Um, adding magnesium oxide or another wide band gap passive scatterer, so something that doesn't provide any gain, gives you another threshold reduction. What we found is that there's a shorter pulse width that does give us reproducibility. So here in the previous slide, let me just go back for a moment, these were pumped with 800 picosecond pulses. And you can see in the individual emission spectra, we do get something that is very highly reproducible. Um, so there's this question as to why a shorter pulse width even with a lower quality gas laser, is going to give you a more reproducible spectrum. And then why does, high why does adding a high quality nanostructure matter? Um, clearly there's some you know, mode selection mechanism. Um, it also seems to participate in threshold reduction. And so that also needs to be explained. And so to do this, um, I developed a time dependent uh, lasing theory. Uh, based on Maxwell block equations. And it's actually uh, based on uh, another theory uh, called SALT, so self-consistent ab initio laser theory. Um, 
this uh, particular, this other theory uh, upon which this is kind of an extension of, uh, is actually a subset of my theory. So the uh, the salt theory uh, is a steady state theory. And essentially, you're taking the Maxwell block equations, which you derive from the von Neumann density matrix, reduce them to the steady state, solve them, and then you have a, uh, an algorithm to figure out the thresholds for your lazing modes. So uh, here in my theory, we just keep the time derivatives, and we accept that the inversion is not stationary. And we write the, uh, the, la the total electric field as uh, a summation of possible modes. And we can get a normalized wave equation for each mode in the system. And then we have our dynamic equation for the population inversion. So if we do some more uh, manipulation, uh, we can get to this first order system of equations. Uh, so in the top equation, I just have the time derivative of the, uh, the lazing mode intensity um, in terms of the population inversion. And um, again, just make, making this F definition, you can rewrite that. And uh, then we have an equation for uh, the population inversion. So we have a, a dynamical system here. We have a first order nonlinear dynamic system. And the spatial part is actually a parameter in this system. Um, so this is very interesting because this suggests that we have different dynamics at different points in space uh, and uh, that are defined by uh, entirely by the gain distribution in the system and then also by uh, the, the d sub zero term, which is our pump term. So now that we have this type of system, we can do some stability analysis by defining fluctuations about critical points. Um, so when we have a very high Q uh, nanostructure where we expect the single mode case, uh, we just have a two by two matrix equation for uh, the dynamical system that we could solve using an eigenvalue approach. Um, here, this is actually a pretty easy system to solve for the case of a steady state pump. And I'll show the show an important result in the next slide. Um, however, this uh, state, this system could be solved also for a uh, an arbitrary pump, which is a, a bit more difficult. Um, but that arbitrary pump around some uh, individual time, uh, solving the evolution around that uh, those points in time would be a frozen coefficient method. And um, there are some other algorithms to to deal with these uh, solutions in nonlinear systems. For now, we'll look at the steady pump. So in the steady state case, uh, if you look at some results, um, th these equations predict relaxation oscillations, and this has been observed experimentally. And so this is very nice because now we have a uh, equation, or we now we have a theory, I should say, that can uh, describe these same dynamics without uh, reducing the uh, system to a single eigenmode. Uh, so it's a much more complete theory than what's been published before. Uh, also, uh, we can look at what the uh, the mode uh, the uh, the modes should look like in the steady state uh, in the presence of one of these defect structures. So uh, one of these high Q nanostructures uh, could be the 860 nanometer spheres that we used in our experiments, and uh, these Hankel eigen modes uh, do fall within the same wavelength range that you would expect to see emission from. And we do see emission uh, in these in these regions. Um, we've been able to do this with polydisperse zinc oxide nanoparticles, so we haven't had to rely on me scattering from a monodisperse set of part nanoparticles outside the sphere. Um, so this is in contrast to some earlier results where they had to rely on monodisperse nanoparticles with a me res with a me scattering. Um, here we're not doing that, um, so it's much easier to coax emission from these uh, systems and still get down to single mode lazing. And then you can see here on the left graph, there appears to be a, a threshold reduction as you get to larger spheres. So you have another, me another lever to control the threshold in the system. So going further, um, we still need to look at why the uh, threshold reduction occurs when you have larger spheres. I, I, you would expect it to probably be something smaller. Uh, we, we should also investigate the stochastic behavior with temporally modulated pumps using this model. Um, so there are these unpredictable, very large fluctuations that have been observed when the pump is temporally modulated, uh, even though the average pump power does not change from pulse to pulse. So this may be uh, the explanation for why this is sometimes why these uh, fluctuations are sometimes seen uh, in in random lasers that are optically pumped with long pulses. So uh, just to end, I'd like to make an acknowledgement to my collaborators uh, from long ago when I was at Portland State University, um, Dr. Rolf Konenkamp and Dr. Robert Word, who have supported this research. If you download the presentation, uh, here are my references. Thank you all, and I'll take your questions if there's time.